Well, praise God and welcome to our Supernatural Sunday services here at Awake the Flame Ministries. We are so glad to have you here online with us. Whether you're watching live or on the replay, I am sure that God will bless you. Well, I'm Apostle Dwayne and today is a very special day. It's Mother's Day and it's a day that we set aside in this nation and in many nations across the planet to celebrate mothers and all that they are. Whether they are biological mothers, whether they may be spiritual mothers, whether they may be a potential mother, we want to celebrate them today. And so we invite you to join with us. We invite you to share this broadcast. Maybe you have a mom in your life that you believe may need encouragement. This service will definitely do that for them. And so we want to give God thanks for mothers. We especially here at Awake the Flame Ministries, we want to give thanks to our mom of the house, Pastor Tao, Prophetess Tao. We want to celebrate her today and she's going to be bringing the word to you. But we celebrate our mama T here at Awake the Flame Ministries. That's what we call her. And I also want to celebrate our mothers as well because without them we wouldn't be here that's my mom Millicent Howard and my mom in love my wife's mom and Christine Maxwell we want to celebrate them today and give God thanks and so if you can just shoot out a prayer for them as I pray for you we'll all pray together as we start our service today well father we just want to thank you for your presence here with us we want to thank you for all that you have set aside for this time that we would share together and we know God there is something special that you want to say to mothers and so father we thank you for ears to hear and hearts to receive we thank you that as your word goes forth lord lives will be touched and transformed and god the power of your spirit would meet us where we're at and shift us into a new place of destiny drawing us closer to you and so god we give you all the glory and all the honor for all that will transpire here and lord if there are any watching that may have felt needs that may have lord needs of healing healing in their body. Lord, I thank you that despite this being a day where we are speaking about mothers, you can still move and touch their bodies and bring wholeness to their frame. In fact, if there are any moms out there, God, that are suffering in their body, that are dealing with sickness and disease, Lord, we want to thank you for your healing power touching them now from the crown of their head to the sole of their feet. And we thank you, Holy Spirit, for releasing fresh life, fresh invigoration, fresh renewal to hearts today. In Jesus' name we pray, amen and amen. And so I invite you now into our time of praise and worship together. Let's praise God. Hallelujah. Welcome, everyone. Welcome. Thank you for joining us for this time of worship. Amen. We are God's kingdom people. We are territory takers. And that is what we are declaring today. Take over. We're moving forward together. Everybody hands up if you know that you're moving to another level. We're not living in fear no more, man. Yeah, we're taking up the mantle. But we alone cannot handle. We need the strength of the Father. Jesus, we surrender. Lord, you take over. Lord, you move in. You are Jehovah. You're my everything. Yeah, we are your people. Oh, this is your land. Lord, you take over. Establish your plan. Take over. Take over. Oh, oh. Seek your face every single day Without you we stumble And living would be in vain Please hear the cries of your people Oh Father save us from evil You've chosen us for a reason Help us to walk in this season Lord you take over Lord you move in You are Jehovah You're my everything Yeah, We are your people Lord This is your land Lord, you take over, establish your plan. Take over, take over, oh, 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 o
no one unworthy of this one thing you've given so freely. Love, please show me a better way and teach me the way of love. Teach me the way of love. And when I feel I've had enough, Take me over and above Teach me the way of love Show me how to do it, God Teach me the way of love Teach me the way of love God, teach me the way of love Show me how to do it, God And when I feel I've had enough Take me over and above 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 And teach me the way of Well, praise God. What a tremendous time of worship in the presence of God. And we want to thank Prophetess Tao and Reverend Carol for their awesome ministry and heart in, again, leading us into that place of presence and encounter with Jesus. And as we continue our service today, we want to continue in that vein of worship, in that place of giving unto the Lord. And as we do, I want to encourage you. God loves a cheerful giver. Here at Awake the Flame Ministries, we don't believe in giving under compulsion or by force. We believe in the cheerfulness of the heart in the process of giving. I want to read to you what Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 6 to 8. He says, But this I say to you, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. So let each one give as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver, and God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that you, always having all sufficiency in all things, may have an abundance for every good work. Amen. That we would have an abundance for every good work, which means in the thing that we are called to do in respect to our destiny, that we will forever be equipped and engaged with all that we need to carry out the work of the kingdom. And we know it's more blessed to give than receive, but we do so with a cheerful heart. We do so giving to God what we can offer to God. Hallelujah. Not under compulsion. And so today I want to encourage you as we enter into this time of worship, as we give unto the Lord, I want to encourage you to do so with a cheerful heart. There are many things that our ministry currently is engaged in. Some of you may know we would have worked last year with the churches in the Philippines after the incredible typhoon Vamco came through and destroyed a lot of the territory. And they're still in the rebuilding process, but we were able to gather funds to build back at least six to eight homes in that area specifically that surround the church community. And we have also worked towards efforts in respect to St. Vincent and what happened there recently with La Supreme, the volcano and its eruption and its effect in the nation there. And we are continuing our work in India as well. As many of you would have heard, we asked for prayer for India just a few weeks ago as they have been battling heavily with COVID-19. And we've had many pastors and leaders suffer in the midst, especially in the remote areas. And we have a special friend and pastor of ours, Pastor Andrew, who is there in those areas and who has been giving us much feedback in respect to the effects of what is happening. And so as you give, I want you to think about these works that we are involved in, because again, we are putting our hands to the plow in making a difference, not just here in our ministry, but in the nations of the earth. And in fact, we are looking to raise a fund to help help the church in India. And so I want to encourage you, 
help us as we work to help the kingdom of God advance in the earth and to help the people of God. And you can sow today by going to our website. The, again, domain name will be right there on the screen right now. And you can go to that URL and you'll see the option to give a one-time gift or you can, again, apply for a monthly recurring gift. All up to you, but at the end of the day, we want you to do so cheerfully and with freedom and with a goodness of heart. Amen. So God bless you as you give and let me pray for you. Father, I want to thank you today for every seed that will be sown. Father, I thank you, God, that you give seed to the sower. In fact, Paul said that in this very same chapter. And Lord, I thank you, God, that you are giving seed to your people. Lord, and even those that may not have seed, that Lord, provision would come to them. Lord God, work would come to them. Opportunity would come to them. We pray for your blessing upon your people, your blessing that makes rich and adds no sorrow. And Lord, as we continue in worship to you, as we give, Lord God, not mattering the amount, but giving, Lord, out of a cheerful heart, we thank you, God. God, according to your word, that you would supply all we need for destiny. And we give you the praise, the glory, and the honor. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God. Now, God bless you. And look out, we're going to have a special announcement here as we celebrate moms. And it will come just before my wife comes, Prophetess Thou, to share the word. So stay tuned for this special announcement. Mother's Day to all the mothers around the world. My name is Isaiah Howard and I just want to say a few things about my mother. Happy Mother's Day, Mommy. You give me hope in the darkest times. You always care for me and I just want to say thank you for helping me through better and worse. You truly are an inspiration and I am proud to be your son. Once again, Happy Mother's Day. Love you and all the other mothers around the world. Happy Mother's Day to all the mothers in the world. My name is Jaden Howard, and I would like to share this message that I wrote from my mom. It goes like this. I love you with my heart. You comfort me in times of stress and disagreement. You seal my heart with love. I love you. From Jaden to my mother, tell. Bye. Happy Mother's Day to all the mothers in the world. I hope you have an amazing day today. My name is Sarah Howard, and I wrote this poem for my mother for Mother's Day. Dear Chow Howard, first of all, happy Mother's Day. Me, Isaiah, and Jaden say good things about you every year. Last year, 2020, was the most craziest year ever. We went through troubling times, both mommy and daddy. Mommy, you have taken care of everyone in the family, and you have held us together through bad times. My mother is strong, smart, careful, confident, courageous, and loving. There are many more words to describe her. I just wanted to say, I love you and happy Mother's Day. Bye. Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us again for our Q2 series. God's Territory Takers. And today is a really special day. I wanna say a happy Mother's Day to all of you ladies who are out there giving God your best for your children, whether biological or spiritual. Um, those women who may not have given birth themselves but have taken others under their wings. We honor you today, we bless you, and we thank God for you. You are so crucial and so valuable to us. So today we are going to carry on from where my husband Dwayne started last week. He did an awesome message starting us out talking about from comfort to calling. And as we go through today, I am going to share a little bit with you in a vein that runs almost parallel to it. And we're going to start today by talking about Jesus and how he always aligned himself with the least of these in society. He was about drawing close to the ones who are considered the dregs of the society. And every time I think about it, every time I see it in scripture, I am so moved and I'm kind of almost tickled to see how this amazing God King, who 
really had no need of us per se. He aligns himself with us in every single way. So as I said, today is Mother's Day. And I wanna talk about how deliberate Jesus was in drawing close to those, as I said, that were considered the least of these. And I wanna put it in terminology for the women, talking about the womb. So we see intention in Jesus' choice of method in coming to bridge the gap between heaven and earth, which is what kingdom is. He crossed the border between heaven and earth to save us. And when man fell, it wasn't enough for him to just wave his hand and, you know, almost like hit a, a reset button. He, the hero of scripture, the hero of history, he stepped boldly into the role that he accepted unto himself. And he launched himself into our speck of a planet, leaving his kingly station for the tiny womb of this world, the tiny womb of earth. He made himself the emissary or the ambassador. He is Emmanuel, God with us. And now we see intention in his choice of vessel. So he doesn't come riding in on some blazing chariot. He didn't just beam himself down here. And he wasn't born into a family of status or some royal affair. This great eternal king, without whom creation would not have commenced, he whittled himself down to the size of a cluster of cells in the womb of a young, unmarried, colored woman from the backside of nowhere. And he aligned himself from the start with the least of these. We see intention in his choice of origin. He emerged from the womb of a fledgling society called Nazareth, from which few believed that any good could come. He accepted not just the position, but the attitude of a servant, the attitude of the lowly. He was of the working class. He was as blue collar as you could get in those days, a carpenter in many respects. And he reduced his footprint to one who would do no damage, making room through his suffering for all at the table. We see intention too in his choice of lifestyle. He constricted himself to the womb of mission and purpose. He would not fit into men's contrived or preconceived notions of who he should be or how he should behave. He devoted himself to justice and not just for the Jews, but for the Gentiles. And he invited us all to draw near to him. Not only did he draw near to us, but he invited us to come boldly and with confidence to him. And we see intention in his choice of ministry birthed out of the womb of obscurity. Our savior, he bucked the system in every way, both societal norms and the messianic expectations of the day. You know, the people would have had this idea that the Messiah would come and he would be this and he would be that, but he, went exactly counterculture to that. And he finally stepped onto the scene, making claims that the religious elite of the day couldn't stomach. He was doing, he was demonstrating and announcing that the kingdom of his father was at hand and it was a shock to the system. Now when Jesus said the kingdom of heaven is at hand or has come near as he did in Matthew chapter 10 verse seven, he was simply declaring that the kingdom had arrived. But implicit in this kingdom arriving and in this uh, kingdom being near is another kind of nearness. And that's what I want to talk to us about today in depth. And this nearness informs our commission as God's territory takers. So today my message is called God's territory takers, the power of proximity. Jesus is our chief ambassador. And he came preaching, not just by words, but by demonstration, by power. His kingdom is one that puts a high premium on proximity. And proximity can be defined as nearness in space, time, or relationship. And we see this beautifully emblazoned across Jesus's life and ministry. Let's talk about him for a little bit. This is the same one who suffered the little children to come unto him. Matthew 19, 14, he had to go to Samaria to redeem a woman who was suffering from the shame and the wounds of her, her past. In John 4, 4, he dined with sinners. He aligned himself with those that were on the fringes of society, the questionable like Mary Magdalene and the cuss birds like Peter, the hated and the infirm like lots of people. He feasted with common folk. He 
partied with people who were celebrating, he made friends with foreigners, and he entertained the curious in covert nighttime rendezvous like Nicodemus. And he welcomed an inner circle to observe his precious prayer time with the Father. This is the same Jesus who put his hands in the dirt and put those same hands in the eyes of a man who needed healing. He touched the leper in Matthew chapter eight, and we're gonna talk a little bit more about him later, and he healed him. He even let Thomas the doubter put his hands into his new wounds, and he washed the feet of his betrayer in John chapter 13. Jesus set proximity as a precedent, not only in physical, tangible experience, but in the intimate intangibility of emotion. And Hebrews 4.15 tells us, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are and yet has not sinned. In scripture, we see that Jesus put highest value on proximity in two contexts. And we see this come out in his commandment in Matthew 22, verses 37 to 39, where he said to us, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, your mind, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. So we see these two commandments, first to a proximity to God, and then to a proximity to man, to draw close in love for our Lord and to draw close in love for people. So let's start with that proximity to our Lord. Now we know in his personal life that Jesus often took time away to pray. He, um, he really felt it was important that he had that constant, continual time where he could just de-stress with the Father, shoot things off of him, be in that constant communion and that fellowship that fueled his ministry and that just kept him, just kept him near to him, that closeness again. But I also want to talk about Martha and Mary and the experience that they had with Jesus that almost sets a tone for how we can have that same proximity with our Lord, the choices that they made and the experiences that they had and what that can maybe say to us in this time. That story was a paradigm breaking moment for a couple of reasons. Um, Jesus and his disciples are at the home of Mary, Martha and Lazarus and Martha is busying herself with all the preparations that are needed to keep a household going. And she comes to Jesus and she's a little bit irate because she feels that Mary has stepped out of the lane that she is supposed to be in. She's shirked her responsibilities and she really should be taking care of all the household things with her. But Jesus looks at her and, and he says, you know, don't worry about Mary. Mary has chosen what she has chosen and I'm okay with it. That's essentially what Jesus was saying. In doing so, Jesus affirms to Martha and to Mary that it's okay for women to sit at the feet of Jesus and be disciples. No, that was groundbreaking in that time. And in some circles, no, it's still groundbreaking because some people wanna say that women don't have that place. But he lets her, a woman, sit at his feet to learn. And in so doing so, he lifts her status, which he always did. Martha is busy with running her household and perhaps house church. She's busy with the preparations, the service. She's a, a, a dedicated, but she's a professional devotee. Mary, in contrast, is caught up in Jesus' teaching. She's sitting in intimate attention at his feet. She's inclining her ear along with these other male disciples. Martha wants the atmosphere of the room to be right for Jesus. Mary knows that once Jesus is in the room, the atmosphere is right. And so she draws near. Now this is the same Mary that later pours that anointing oil, that perfume upon Jesus' feet, and she wipes those feet with her hair. And not to mention, we see in both this exchange and conversations later between Mary and Martha and Jesus that they really were not afraid because of the intimacy of their relationship to speak their mind. You know, Mary would say to him later, you know, Jesus, Lazarus is dead. Uh, Martha would echo the same things. Why didn't you come? And Martha, even in this situation, she says, do you not care that Mary is not doing what she's supposed to do? And Jesus is not offended by their personal feelings. In fact, 
In many instances, he is moved. The question for us is, how do we be Mary's in a Martha generation when there are so many distractions, so many things taking up our time, um, and, and so much work is needed? It's so, the work is so great in every sphere. We must strike balance between the Martha and the Mary in our life. I mean, the fact is, Jesus didn't say, Martha, your part is bad. He said, or by imp implication, he said, your part is good, but Mary has chosen the better thing. The answer is we must prioritize and value our time spent with him. That proximity with him is so crucial. We cannot deal with proximity with others if we don't first have in place constant communion with him. That feeds in to the proximity with others that we're going to talk about later. Jesus' is coming breached the final frontier. That last barrier that separated the kingdoms of heaven and earth. He generously invited people into the space of his presence, time, heart, and mind. And this um, uncommon act was common practice for him. But what happened is Martha chose to orbit while Mary chose to enter. And that choice is still ours today. It is important for me to note here, though, that Jesus was not doing all of this in his own accord. He had the fullness of the Godhead in agreement with him. He made it clear that the culture of the kingdom that he preached and demonstrated on the earth was a direct representation of the king of the kingdom. He was essentially saying, this isn't just me, guys. This is what my father does, and therefore I am doing the same thing. In fact, right after healing the man at the pool of Bethesda, Jesus makes things very clear for his critics. In John chapter 5, verse 19, he says, So Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, the son can do nothing of his own accord, but only what he sees the father doing. For whatever the father does, that the son does likewise. For the father loves the son and shows him all that he himself is doing. And greater works than these will he show him so that you may marvel. Secondly, even when he removed himself via resurrection, he did not leave us forsaken. He did not leave us forlorn in this territory called earth. He sent us the Holy Spirit as a teacher, a constant reminder, a comforter, to reinforce for us all that he taught us while he was present with us and to be a friend that sticks closer than a brother. Not only does he set the task before us, he instills and infills in us that dunamis power to do it. He gives us the dunamis to do it. This is important because God's reputation, and maybe if we used a, a new word, a, a recent word, a trending word, his brand, God's brand is at stake here. Because sometimes, if we're honest, it can feel like we are dealing with a God that is afar off, who is removed from the challenges and concerns of his people. You know, some people say to themselves, ah, I like Jesus, I, I understand what he stood for, I, I like what he was about, I'm not sure about his father, <laughs> right? But we see from the scriptures we've, we've mentioned that what Jesus did is what his father does. The heart that Jesus had is a heart that his father has. And we can embrace him as Abba in the same way that Jesus embraces him as Abba. Jesus at, at every turn reminds us that our heavenly father is not a God whose hand is short to save or his ear dull to hear. He is a God who desires relationship and in his words is working to this day. And secondly, this is important because look what happens. By chapter 14, Jesus is handing that mandate for greater works over to his followers. They were thrown by this, and spoiler alert, that includes you and me as citizens of his kingdom. Those greater works we shall do as well. John 14, 12 says, Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me also will do the works that I do. And greater works than these will he do because he was going to the Father. According to Dr. Miles Monroe in his book, Rediscovering the Kingdom, its social culture separates and distinguishes the kingdom from all others around it. It expresses the nature of the king through the lifestyle of his citizens. So likewise, if we are truly abiding in Christ, or as uh, Dr. Miles calls him, our chief ambassador, our secretary of state, they should know that we are Christians by our love. 
And if we don't get this right, we display an inaccurate or a false or a faulty image of who God is and who he wants to be and desires to be to his people. I'm reminded too of the Gypsy Smith quote that says, there are five gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and the Christian. And most people will never read the first four. So then what is required of us? What do these greater works look like? Matthew 23, 11 says, the greatest among you shall be your servant. And 1 John 2, 4 says, whoever says I know him, but does not keep his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, in him truly the love of God is perfected. By this we may know that we are in him. Whoever says he abides in him ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. And so as ambassadors of heaven, as followers of and joint heirs with Christ, we are required to be image bearers of the king. The culture of his kingdom, as I said before, comes with a call to proximity in these ways. This is what it looks like to establish justice in Jesus' way. And this is what it means to follow in his way. He does not merely condemn corruption. He challenges the current culture. He champions change. He gets into the thick of it with us. He goes to the fringes. He calls the unacceptable, the unworthy, the outcast, and the flickering flame close to death. Let's talk about proximity to others. Now, Jesus told a story once that most of us will be very, very familiar with. And I just want to draw our attention to a few things. In Luke 10, 30, we read about the good Samaritan. And in reply, Jesus said, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So too, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, get this, came where the man was. And when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. He put the man on his own donkey. He took him to an inn. He gave money to the innkeeper. He said, look after him. I will reimburse you for anything that you have to do for this man and for any extra expense you have. And then Jesus finished it off by saying, you know, which, which do you think was a neighbor? And the expert in the law uh, replied, the one who had mercy on him. Jesus told him, go and do likewise. So here's one small detail and um, God is in the details. One small detail stood out to me as I read this over, and that is that the Levite and the priest made it a point to pass over <laughs> on the other side of the road. But the Samaritan, or the good neighbor, he came to where the injured man was. He put himself in proximity, in nearness. And here are some of the things we learn from this example of proximity. Number one, proximity pushes us past dividing lines and into the pain of the other person. And I think this is so crucial in a time when there are so many tensions, racial tensions, political tensions, etc. When we can get past those dividing lines and begin to see from the other person's perspective, put ourselves in their shoes, we are in a much better place to assist, to learn, and to come to a place of camaraderie, a place of wholeness, a place of unity. Number two, Proximity makes neighbors out of strangers. And I'm sure in many ways we would have seen this even through this pandemic. Number three, proximity is not about personal benefit, but it is not without reward. And number four, proximity awakens in us an awareness that fuels compassion. So this Samaritan man, he got himself down on the same level as this man who was broken and downtrodden. And when you do that, you cannot help but see them differently if you're seeing with the eyes of empathy. And number five, proximity requires sacrifice and it comes at personal cost. And that personal cost can be um, monetary, that, that personal cost can be time, that personal cost can be a lot of different things. I consider also Jesus's encounter with a leper. And when I 
when I got into this story, I really got excited in Luke 5. Luke 5 verse 12 says, while Jesus was in one of the towns, a man came along who was covered with leprosy. When he saw Jesus, he fell with his face to the ground and begged him, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Jesus reached out his hand and touched the man. I am willing, he said, be clean. And immediately the leprosy left him. Then Jesus ordered him, don't tell anyone, but go show yourself to the priest and offer the sacrifices that Moses commanded for your cleansing as a testimony to them. Yet the news about him spread all the more so that crowds of people came to hear him and be healed of their sicknesses. But Jesus, proximity to the Lord again, often withdrew to lonely places and he prayed. Now I learned some things about leprosy this toss because I've always assumed that leprosy was this uh, flesh eating disease. No one wanted to be around you talking about stinking and different things. Um, leprosy is horrible, but not quite for the reasons that I used to think. So leprosy is, is actually not a highly contagious flesh eating disease. It's a disease that causes damage to the body's nervous system and it can develop, you can have it in your body and not know for up to five years before it actually shows itself. As a result, leprosy simply causes you not to be able to feel anything because of that nerve damage. And it may eventually cause your whole body to go numb and just lose all sensitivity. So therefore a person is more prone to injury. That's why you tend to see people who might have missing digits, uh, limbs and so on, because they, they're not able to, to sense that something is wrong. They're, they're not able to feel extreme cold or heat or those kinds of things. And they may have those extremities amputated. And on top of that, because of this stigma, even to this day, we have uh, less than 200 cases in the United States, but in uh, poor countries and places where there's not uh, as much sanitary um, and sanitary health care and all that kind of thing, it still uh, shows its face. And in many impoverished areas, people, as in Jesus' day, are ostracized, they're scorned, they're rejected, they're isolated from community and from resources, which just perpetuates the problem. Now, can you imagine what it would be like to never know that you are in pain? Can you imagine what it would be like to not be able to sense temperature, to never enjoy a warm touch or an embrace? But then comes along King Jesus, okay? And he doesn't reject him. He doesn't even flinch. This man clearly has had this disease for a while because it says that he is covered in leprosy. This is, this is well developed. This has been going on for a while. It has taken its toll on his body. And this poor man is so full of shame and his own riddled condition that he doesn't even want to make eye contact. He throws himself on the floor. He falls to his knees because his previous experiences with people clearly have not been pleasant, but yet there is something that he can see in the eyes of the son of man that he appeals to. He appeals to the goodness that he perceives coming off of, of Jesus. God help your goodness to come off of us as kingdom people. And Jesus reaches out his hand to touch him. Now that, that always stood out to me is like, you know, is Jesus had no, almost like no care in the world. He didn't worry about getting sick or getting afflicted. Clearly it wasn't as much of a thing, but the fact that this man would have for the first time in how many years felt the divine touch of Jesus. It is the first thing you feel in 20 years that the hand of God is upon you. I can imagine him just being so overwhelmed by emotion, not just the emotion of being healed, but the emotion of being accepted in the beloved. Number six, proximity creates a channel for healing and for miracles. Proximity only comes through vulnerability. This man had to say, you know what? I don't care what has happened before. I am going to lay myself down and hope that Jesus is going to do all the things I've heard said about him. And Jesus, in the other direction, he also had to be vulnerable with him to put his hand out and touch and embrace this man who all he had known for so long was to be cast off. Proximity, again, number eight, takes mutual willingness and it takes effort. And proximity is sacred and it must be protected. But finally, number 10, proximity is worth the risk because it can completely 
transform a life. Now, some people avoid proximity because they don't want to hit a nerve. And Jesus did the exact opposite. He went straight for the man's nerve. He went straight for every nerve ending that he had. And he reached out with the healing touch of compassion. This is the, uh, the power to effect change that resides in us. I'm going to make this last observation. When we, when we refuse to make proximity a part of our lives, when we cannot feel, when we're the ones that cannot feel and react to the pain within Christ's body, we become the lepers. And we are the ones who need a touch from God. So Lord, I pray even today as I'm standing here now, Lord, that you would just break our hearts for what breaks yours, that we would be touched with the feelings and the infirmities of those who surround us and that we would be good neighbors and reach out one to another, Lord. So as I come to a close, again, it's Mother's Day. And ladies, I just want to point a few things that are special about you as relates to uh, kingdom, kingdom taking, territory taking, and how uniquely we designed we are for doing exactly that. We are natural nourishers, and nourishment requires nearness. We carry kingdom culture in our spiritual wombs. We know what it is to bear down and birth change. We know what it is to give and receive intimacy in heavy-handed doses. Anybody who can't get their children to separate from them at any given point in time <laughs> knows exactly what that's like. We are well acquainted with the kind of love that gets its hands dirty, all day dirty, all day, all day dirty, but then it loves people clean. We are gap bridgers, we are breach repairers. I mean, seriously, how often are you stopping fights in your kitchen? I'm, I'm doing it three times a day. We know what it is to get violent with anything that, that threatens our babies. And there are some spiritual babies out there that are flailing in the wind, being tossed by, by everything that comes at them and that need someone to fight for them and to hold them steady and to let them know that better is possible. They say a oh, oh, mother's work is never done from rising sun to setting sun. For me, it's to rising third sun. And kingdom work is much the same. It is constant and it requires us to be consistent. It often goes unnoticed and sometimes it's thankless. It is lowly, uncomfortable service. But as I said before, it does have great rewards. So Mary, Martha, Esther, could it be that you have come to the kingdom for such a time as this? I am reminded of a sermon by Reverend Dr. Prathya Hall where she talked about some late great Baptist women called the Bible bands, who were mighty servant-hearted influencers for the kingdom of, kingdom of God within their day and within their context. And I will encourage you to Google them, look them up and find out more about them on YouTube. Uh, she goes very deeply in depth about who they were and what they did. And I'm gonna give you a, a quote from her, a praise of some of what she shared in that message. She said, these women, did hand-to-hand -hand combat against sin, sickness, death, and disease. And they didn't do it with a long-handled spoon, but they did it up close and personal. I almost wish I had the American accent to bring it over for you. She was an amazing preacher. They did it house-to-house, -house, shack to shack heart-to-heart, -heart, hand hand-to-hand, and life-to-life. -life. Don't despair. Just remember who you are. Just remember whose you are. Just remember the battle has already been fought. The victory has already been won. People of God, we represent a kingdom that begs intimacy, that makes space for others different from ourselves. As kingdom citizens, we must be tactile, approachable, vulnerable. If the king of kings suffers himself to be affected by the afflictions and infirmities of this world, how much more we? We have a mandate to follow the customs of this kingdom we represent. So let's embrace seeking kindness. Even in a pandemic, let us find ways to, you know, real time tangible ways to foster strong relationships and to be good neighbors. The kingdom will not be advanced without our proximity to God, to people and even to their problems. And territory cannot be taken 
unless we step out of our comfort zones and into the unknown. So that's all I have for you today. I just wanna say again, happy Mother's Day to you mothers, and I'm just gonna pray and bless you before I go. Father, thank you for these wonderful women of God, these kingdom women who have devoted their lives to you, Lord God. And I pray even for those who may not know you yet, but are beginning to see that they have purpose and destiny in this earth. Father, I thank you, Lord God, for your blessing in their lives. I thank you for your grace, for your keep. I thank you, Lord God, for surrounding them with your love and reminding them that you are concerned about everything that concerns them. I pray that you will continue to, to heal them on the inside, Lord God, and, and where there are physical ailments, Lord God, I thank you for healing them on the outside in Jesus' name. I thank you that they are birthing kingdom every day within their own spaces and even out of their own wombs as they raise up young men and women who are going to be valiant and violent and take the kingdom by forth by force and i pray also for the gentlemen who come alongside them lord god and champion them who encourage them who say to them yes of course you can run that race i'm here for you i'm here with you i pray that you will just continue to rain down your righteousness upon us all and i thank you for your goodness to us this day and every day of our lives in jesus name amen thank you so much for joining us today god bless you amen